This is The Strange Recital, a podcast about fiction which questions the nature of reality. <laughs> the chateau in which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me in my desperately wounded condition to pass a night in the open air was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the apennines, not less, in fact, than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls not only in their main surfaces, but in their very many nooks which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary, in these paintings my incipient delirium perhaps had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of the tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately, to the contemplation of these pictures and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow which purported to criticise and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devotedly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and outreaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturb my slumbering valet, I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent even to my own perception, but while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I now saw aright I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses, and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what was technically termed a vignette manner, much in the style of the favourite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, gilded, and filigreed in moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. But it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance which had so suddenly and vehemently moved me. Least of all could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design, the vignetting, and of the frame, must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained, for an hour perhaps, half-sitting, half-reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute 
life likeliness of expression, which, at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position, the cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view. I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw, and loved, and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art. She, a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles and frolicsome as a young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark, high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on, uncomplaining, because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words, as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labour drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret. For the painter had grown wild with the ardour of his work, and turned his eyes from canvas merely, even to regard the countenance of his wife. And he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sate beside him. And when many weeks had passed, and but little remained to do save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed, and for one moment the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought. But in the next, while he yet gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid, and aghast, and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself, turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. That was The Oval Portrait, written and read by Edgar Allan Poe. No, written by Edgar Allan Poe and read by Fred Stelling. Why are you playing birdsong? Oh, it helps me to relax. I'll turn it off when he gets here.
Do you have a plan B? I do, but let's give it a few more minutes, huh? What are you waiting for? You know, Fred, don't feel you have to stick around. Thanks for reading the story. You did a great job. Yeah, thanks. And we're waiting for Edgar Allan Poe to get here. You might be waiting a long time. He died in 1847. I think it was 1849, actually. Huh. Well, that's no excuse, whenever it was. I've been looking for him all morning. I went to every fucking bar in town. Ha! Mm. He looks like that actor, right? Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, you know, uh, the, the guy the guy that played Django Reinhardt. Oh, you mean Sean Penn? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Oh. Sean Penn, yeah. Kind of a squishy face. Did you see him? Who? Sean Penn. No, of course not. Huh. I saw Vincent Price, though, in the hardware store. Really? Can you turn off those birds now? Okay, okay, if that's what you want. We were getting to a good bit, though. No. Uh, what makes you think Edgar Allan Poe is going to show up? I sent him an email. You emailed him? Yeah. You have his email address? No, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how can you email him if you don't have his address? I just wrote E.A. Poe and hit send. Hmm. And he never got back to me. I know he has some problems, but even so. Uh, what's plan B? Uh, plan B? Yeah, yeah, maybe it's time to move on. I got this laudanum from Amazon. I just happened to get three bottles, so one for each of us. Oh. Here you go. Thanks. Let's start with this. It says poison on it. Oh, that's probably just something their legal department came up with. Don't worry about it. He's drained it. God, it's bitter. Fred, you're not meant to take the whole thing in one go. It's meant to be a spoonful or two. Huh? Christ. Why are we taking laudanum? Because I just read in De Quincey's Diary of an Opium Eater that this stuff affects one's sense of time. One year can seem like 70. <sighs> this is just what we need for plan B. So take your medicine. Here's a spoon. Once upon a midnight mm, not bad. dreary... While I pondered weak and Are you okay, Fred? Mm. Yeah, I'm fine. This isn't too bad. So, what exactly is plan B? Seeing as that fucker Poe didn't show up, Fred is going to be him. Mm. He's here, he read the story. It makes sense. Brent, you'll be Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and I'll be Socrates. Together, uh -huh. Socrates and Coleridge will interview Edgar Allan Poe. Brilliant, right? Hmm. Prophet, said I, thing of evil. Prophet still, if bird or devil. Okay, I think he's off. <laughs> you know, he married a 13-year-old girl. What kind of guy would do that? Yeah. Right, well, we should get this while we can. You go first as Coleridge, and I'll follow with the question of Socrates. What the fuck is he doing out there? <laughs> Yeah, you can go first, unless, of course, you think Socrates should go first and then Coleridge but become... I don't want to be Coleridge. Undaunted it's Coleridge, actually. Why did you pick Socrates for yourself? You're being really bossy. Well, somebody has to keep this together. Who was out all day looking for Poe? Nah. Did you have to go and get shit-faced before 11 a.m. for the sake of art? I don't think so. Is there a plan C? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, there is. We abandon this whole thing, write it off as an abject failure, and pipe in Mantovani for the next ten minutes. I thought it was Mantovani. What? Like the uh, Count of Monte Is there a bomb in Gilead? Tell me. Tell me. Quoth the raven, nevermore. What channels are you on? Where's the mute button, damn it? By that heaven.
This is The Strange Recital, on the web at thestrangerecital.com. The music on this episode was an excerpt of the Nocturne in E minor, Opus Posthumus 72, by Chopin. Incidentally, Chopin died in the same year as Poe, 1849. I believe they died ten days apart and had about the same lifespan. That probably means nothing, but Brent might not agree. You also heard an arrangement of Send in the Clowns by Mantovani and his orchestra, a thing of breathtaking beauty in my opinion, though I don't think we need any more clowns at the moment. All of us here at The Strange Recital would like to apologise for the problems we encountered during this episode, and we promise that we're going to do our best to not let this kind of thing happen in the future. This is episode 20052.